Um, we're very honored to have some, the participation of some distinguished speakers here today from Hong Kong and the United States who will discuss how to leverage the Hong Kong platform to expand your entertainment business in Asia. Um, our sessions will be divided into three parts. Um, the first session is a panel discussion on film co-production and distribution, which will be followed by individual presentations, and then a second panel on a uh, discussion on digital entertainment, an area that's really uh, important to us. Um, lastly, but certainly not least, we'll have elaborations on why Hong Kong should be chosen as your platform ex for expansion in Asia. Um, so without further ado, let's first invite Mr. Peter Lam, who's chairman of the Hong Kong Trade and Development Corporation and the Entertainment Industry Advisory Committee to say a few words for us. Mr. Lam, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Chow, Mr. Herman Lam, Mr. Andrew Davis, Mr. Jerry Liu, Mr. Jonathan Wolf, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's such a big, me a great pleasure to be with you all here in Los Angeles. Let me welcome you all to the Fing Asia, Fing Hong Kong. Today's thematic sections on film and digital entertainment is made possible through the joint effort by Hong Kong Trade Demand Council and Hong Kong Cyber Port Management Company Limited. Entertainment played a key focus specifically as it pertains to be Hong Kong as the hub for entertainment companies in the U.S. to expand the business in Asia. As being one of the filmmakers and entertainment executives myself, we all share the same vision to excel our creative business. Maybe you are seeking for the right partner for co-productions or distributions. Maybe you want access to the booming mobile and gaming industry in Asia. Maybe you're just interested to see what opportunities Asia can present for your business. No matter what you are or plans, I can reassure you that you're making the right decisions to attend this special event. We are here to tell you more about Hong Kong advantages and how we can help your business succeed in our part of the world. As you all know, Asia entertainment industry is growing rapidly, both on the demand and supply side. Take our film industry as an example. Asian film industry as a whole is gaining her momentum, consolidating its position and earning global recognitions, both in the prestigious global film festival and box office. We are proud and delighted to have the Chinese director, Annie, who recently sc scored the Best Director Award for the second time with his latest film, Life of Pi. The Thank you. And Pieta of South Korea production won a Golden Lion Award in Venice last year. And the Grandmaster by Hong Kong director Wang Ga Wai was picked as the opening film for the 213 Berlin International Film Festival. Growth in the mainland Chinese film market has been particularly impressive over the best decade. With this vast population of over 1.3 billion, we provide a huge appetite for film productions. In quality and diversifying, the mainland box office took in U.S. $2.75 billion in 2012, a strong growth of 30% year on year. Hong Kong, on the other hand, ranked first in Asia in terms of per capita productions. We have one of the largest and most dynamic film entertainment industry in the world. The success of Hong Kong mainland co-production is really a good example of Hong Kong can be a good platform to tap on the soaring Chinese mainland market. Last year, six out of 10 top box office hit on the mainland were Hong Kong mainland co-productions. But we are not just about films. Hong Kong is one of the Asian most innovative economics with an abundant supply of creative talents. With our first class information and communications infrastructures, high internet and smartphone penetrations and open online environments, Hong Kong is also a desirable base for multimedia and digital entertainment productions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you all again to advance these timely discussions. I can promise you all the discussion here will be productive and instrumental. By choosing Hong Kong as your partner for business venture into Chinese and Asia markets, these thematic sections will fit you perfectly and Asia has been taking up a bigger role in the global entertainment market. Let me introduce our renowned panels of films and digital entertainment experts with us today. They share the insight to capture this more rapidly soaring entertainment market in Asia. We are confident to provide you Hong Kong as the gateway to Chinese mainland markets. Hong Kong DDC is dedicated to promote Hong Kong entertainment industry. 
and helping global industry players exporting business opportunities that Hong Kong can render and facilitate. If Asia is your future business plan, don't stop here. Seize the day and come to Hong Kong yourself. Also, please come and visit the Hong Kong International Film and TV Market Experience, our film mark yourself, which will take place in Hong Kong next year from the 24th to 27th March, organized by Hong Kong TDC. As Asia's leading entertainment market, film mark is now the largest of its kind in Asia. The 17, 17 editions of film mark this year attract more than 700 exhibitors, along with more than 6,300 visitors from nearly 50 countries and regions another record-breaking years again. For the third year in a row, Film Mark featured a U.S. pavilion organized by the Independent Film and TV Alliance. Together with other individual U.S. companies, a total of 45 U.S. exhibitors has taken part in the four-day event. They did more than $8 million U.S. million in deals this year. Whenever you are in the films, TV, animations, or gaming industry, you will find exciting business opportunities and viable partners at Finmark. In brief, Hong Kong is a very good platform for U.S. businessmen and companies to expand in Asia. I can go on and on, citing more reasons for to assure you to take a look at Hong Kong yourself. Let me stop here and give you a chance to enjoy this Fing Asia, Fing Hong Kong. Before closing, I would like to thank Cyberport for co-organizing today's seminar. Cyberport is Hong Kong leading information and communication technology hub with state-of-the-art facilities to nurture and cluster technology and digital talents. We are here, we are delighted to have Mr. Herman Ham, the CEO of Cyberport, to be with us today. Herman will share more on Hong Kong role as a dynamic digital hub of Asia Pacific shortly. Last but not least, a special thank must go on to IFTA for supporting this seminar. I wish you all have a pragmatic discussion this afternoon. Hope to see you all in Hong Kong. I would like to Leave the panel to Herman. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Herman Lam, who is CEO of the Hong Kong Cyberport Management Company Limited. He's going to please uh, say a few words. So, welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it's with a great pleasure that uh, we have all of you joining us in this event today. Uh, so, we have two themes today, right? We have the film and we have also the digital entertainment. So in the area of digital entertainment and also IT, uh, Cyberport has played an important role uh, in Hong Kong and also as, a, as a one of the leading ICT hubs in the Asia Pacific region. In this morning, you've learned a lot about how great Hong Kong is and how Hong Kong can be, a, uh, can be your great partner and your gateway into Asia, in particular uh, uh, China. I think Mr. So gave us a charter to show you how in this afternoon. And, uh, and of course, we have uh, three very exciting panels waiting to share with you why Hong Kong is your, should be your best partner and why Hong Kong could be your gateway into China. Before we do that though, I would like to share with you the first how, which is Cyberport. Um, Cyberport is a community where we have a lot of uh, creative individuals, companies in, that, uh, uh, in this community. Uh, we focus in areas such as digital entertainment, IT, uh, mobile applications, social media. These are the areas that we focus in. When I, when I say Cyberport can be, your, can be your partner, can be your how to get into uh, Hong Kong and get into China, the first thing I want to refer to is the community at Cyberport. So in terms of the companies at Cyberport, we have uh, already more than 120 companies at Cyberport, many of them are uh, in the digital entertainment, uh, including a very uh, famous uh, post-production house, uh, Central, in Hong Kong. We have also a lot of IT companies, including big names like Microsoft, IBM, SAP, and Cisco. We have also a lot of the uh, mobile application developers, which we have in Hong Kong. So this, this community, together with 5,000 people working at Cyberport, can be your great partner uh, to launch your platform. Together with all these like-minded people, it will be very helpful for you to find out exactly how they have been tapping into this big opportunity of China and Hong Kong and how can they help you in, in that journey. The second important point about uh, why Cyberport can be your partner is that not only we have a physical community, we are also doing a lot of uh, programs which I will always refer to as the, the virtual Cyberport. So many of the programs that we do actually we, uh, uh, we partner with together with TDC. 
So we will take delegations to, for example, like today, we'll take delegations to the United States. We've done it, uh, the similar things to other countries, including last year we were in Japan, and then we also was in uh, Canada. But then more importantly, we take a lot of this sort of delegations into many different cities within the mainland China. So uh, by launching into Cyberport, you will actually or automatically be also in many, many different cities within mainland China. So that's absolutely a very important advantage of uh, being a, joining the community of Cyberport. And the third one is uh, we do also provide a lot of the, uh, all, all of the assistance in terms of uh, software and hardware and consultancy support. Uh, we have a full post-production studio at Cyberport, which you can uh, leverage while not to build your own studio, you can leverage all the facilities that we have there. And if you are in the ICT industry, if you are in the mobile uh, industry, we have a lot of, uh, we have an exhibition center where we will showcase all the successful uh, mobile applications that we have in Hong Kong and particularly at Cyberport. Uh, we also provide a lot of computing power to our users as well. So we've commissioned a, a cloud computing platform so for smaller or startups, they can actually develop and test drive their applications on our platform and actually can use it to launch to the first batch of customers as well. Um, another thing I want to mention is, is uh, we do a lot of, the, a lot of uh, uh, exhibitions, conferences, and seminars and trainings uh, at Hong Kong and also in many other cities. Just earlier this year in April, we have uh, just organized a world-class uh, world event, Digital Entertainment Leadership Forum, which we invite a lot of uh, uh, renowned speakers from the United States, uh, New Zealand, and all over the world, and also in China, to speak in Hong Kong. So if you are interested in all these opportunities, please do you know, talk to us, and we will probably uh, be able to figure out you know, how we can best engage you to launch your products and services in Hong Kong through all these all this different activities as well. Last but nevertheless, I want to also ensure you that uh, we, we, uh, we do provide very flexible terms. So we have talked a lot about the benefit of being part of the uh, uh, Cyberport community, but how do you engage with us? Uh, there's a couple of ways. First of all, you can, if you do want to set up an office in Hong Kong, you can come to us. We, have all, we offer very flexible terms, world-class facility. But if you do not want to do that just yet, you just want to explore and join the enjoy the virtual cyberport and want to be able to be uh, part of the programs that I just mentioned, you can also join us as a subscriber through our collaboration center. So we, we, with all of this, we just want to make sure that you understand you are totally welcome to cyberport. Last but nevertheless, I want to mention one last program, which is our incubation program. So we are also a, an uh, a incubator in Hong Kong. We focus in the area I just mentioned, digital entertainment, mobile applications, um, social networking, software development. So, uh, of course, we will focus on companies in Hong Kong, but I think you have already, already learned it this morning. To be a Hong Kong company is in a matter of hours. And we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't differentiate the country of origins of the owners. So if you want to join our incubation program, you can do that as well. Uh, we offer very uh, good terms. We have uh, two-year programs, and uh, we offer also up to $530,000 Hong Kong to assist you in your journey of, uh, in, in, your, in your digital entertainment uh, startup journey. So with all of this, I hope I give you a first taste of why Hong Kong is a great gateway and why Cyberport could be a how to access to that gateway. And with that, I want to uh, thank you again for joining us and please enjoy the event. We have three renowned speakers from Hong Kong and the United States who have come here today to share with us about the winning strategies for co-production and distribution in Asia with your film or entertainment business. Uh, may I now invite the moderator of the panel, Mr. Patrick Freider, who is CEO of Film Business Asia to come to the stage. We also welcome our other speakers, Mr. Albert Lee, who is CEO of Emperor Motion Pictures, Mr. Andre Morgan, who is co-founder of Ruddy Morgan Organization. Um, Mr. Freder, we'll now turn it over to you to, to manage the panel. Thank you. I am very happy to be moderating this panel. Uh, I have two very entertaining guests, very knowledgeable guests as well. And you may see just three of us on the panel here, but in fact, there's many hats here. Albert is a former journalist like me. You also have, in these two gentlemen, two former Golden Harvest executives. You have a, a Hong Kong-based Chinese producer, and you also have a Los Angeles-based Chinese producer here. So 
many, many personalities on this, on this, around this table. Um, we're going to get to Andre and Albert in a second, but I just wanted to say a few things as well. Um, I'm a lousy salesman, so I can only tell you things that I actually believe in. Um, so I'm going to tell you a true story. Um, I moved to Hong Kong, I think it's about eight years ago now, um, and I have absolutely no reason to regret doing so. Um, I, in fact, I frequently hear myself saying to people that Hong Kong is the center of the universe. Uh, I think I said this to one poor lady at lunchtime. Uh, I moved there, in fact, in order to set up the Asia office for Variety magazine. Um, and we had, the, you know, we had a clear open playing field. We could have gone anywhere. Uh, we, we, we had the opportunity to settle anywhere in Asia to do this. Um, but as we looked at the various different possibilities, we realized that all the other cities which we were thinking of were in fact compromised. If we'd set up in Beijing, that would have been the China office, not necessarily the Asia office. Um, had we set up in Japan, in Tokyo, it would have been the Japanese office because the Japanese film industry is fairly insular and inward looking. And so it went through Seoul and so on. And we realized that Hong Kong is probably the most Asian city of all. It also has a, a very important uh, legacy film industry. Uh, I think you probably know many of the, the big names like Wong Kar Wai, uh, John Woo, Choi Hark, Johnny To, and so on. It's also the home of many of the stars who are uh, continue to be Asia's leading stars. Um, whether it's Jackie Chan, Chai Yun Fat, Donnie Yen, or Jet Li, of those, most of them actually were not born in Hong Kong, but they had their break in Hong Kong. They made their career there. That's also true of uh, the ladies, the leading ladies, uh, Michelle Yeoh and Maggie, Yu Maggie Q, who's now in her third season uh, in Nikita on American TV. I suspect the reason for this is that Hong Kong really is uh, a very efficient uh, hub for international goods and services, and that includes film services. And although it's probably true to say that Hong Kong is not enjoying the same golden age as it was um, 20, 30 years ago when Albert and Andre were, were at Golden Harvest, um, it's still making 55 films a year, as, as Dr. Lam mentioned. And with a population of 7 million, that must be some of the most productive filmmakers in the world. It's perhaps partly because uh, Hong Kong is geographically well positioned. I happen to know that it, it's equidistant between Mumbai and Tokyo, because I actually did that trip a few weeks ago. Um, but also equidistant between Beijing and Singapore, between Shanghai and, and Bangkok, and Manila as well. Um, it, it's, it's very well positioned for, for the Asia business. And after I left Variety three years ago uh, to start my current business, Film Business Asia, the same factors were all exactly at play. But then I also came across Hong Kong as a, as a business center in my own right. It took just a few days to set up a company and less than $1,000 to be in business. So you see, I've, I've actually lived a little bit of, of, of what we're talking about and what we heard this morning. But enough about me. Albert, I hope you're ready for my first question. Um, I've talked, I just mentioned very briefly the, the, the golden era of, of Hong Kong. How does Hong Kong, how's the transition happened in the last, is it 10 years or 20 years? Um, good afternoon. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, uh, Hong Kong, the, the film business in Hong Kong has changed tremendously over the last uh, 30 odd years, you know, since 1979, when I first joined Golden Harvest to work under Andre and Mr. Don't Raymond Chow. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the uh, the market has changed uh, substantially. I think uh, the focus for the last five to ten years, I suppose, has shifted um, towards China. Uh, it is uh, to many of us uh, the so-called final frontier, um, and. Uh, we have been uh, focusing most of our efforts there. Um, the whole the whole business has changed. Uh, Andre, do you? Yeah, I totally agree with that. But I think really the key is that for the Hong Kong film industry, um, which has always, I should point out, not been supported by the Hong Kong government with any tax credits or any soft loans, has had to stand on its own commercial two feet. And so Hong Kong has been very good at 
seeking out new markets or new ways of reinventing itself. And so from the early days of Bruce Lee and Kung Fu through to John Woo and Cha Yun Fat and then the wave of Hong Kong directors that came to Hollywood in the late 1980s, Hong Kong has survived by its wits. And to that end, for all of the Americans, if there are any sitting out in the audience that are thinking about going to Asia and doing productions, as an American that's been doing it for 40 years, I can assure you, you're better off to use Hong Kong as your starting point than either Shanghai or Beijing, where I have offices. Hong Kong has the experience of doing co-productions for the last 40 years. You have a bi bilingual, very sophisticated and well-trained group of technicians that are film savvy in both the latest technology and also in what sells. Now to come back, having made the plug for Hong Kong, to come back to Albert's question, Hong Kong directors and the Hong Kong film industry made a conscious choice starting in 2000 to start focusing on the China market. And I think they've been, for a small little place like Hong Kong, incredibly, incredibly successful and have had a tremendous impact on the direction of Chinese cinema in the last 10 years. So uh, we, we, we've heard the, the term Hong Kong as a bridge, and we've also heard the term superconductor. <coughs> do you, so do you accept that uh, as Hong Kong's role in the Chinese film industry? Me? Yeah. I, I don't know. I think that for Hong Kong, Hong Kong has kind of always been a unique place. Whether you say Hong Kong's a borrowed place on borrowed time, um, what has always made Hong Kong special are the people of Hong Kong. And the people in Hong Kong are very good at helping to explain to foreigners what the problems are, whether it's the problems of working in Hong Kong, or I suspect for foreigners first going to China now, they would best be served to have a Hong Kong partner taking them there that can bridge all of the cultural gaps, because there are certainly major cultural gaps between the way Hollywood operates and the way China operates. And I think Hong Kong is well positioned to act either as the bridge or the meat in the grinder or the <laughs> oil in the gears or whatever you want to call it. And I would urge American companies looking to set up in Asia to follow Patrick's uh, lead or Variety's lead and consider seriously putting their first base in Hong Kong. You have British law, basically. You have a free banking system, which makes it very easy to remit money, well, in this day and age, as easy it is anywhere, to remit money freely to pay people, which you don't have when you're in China trying to pay your actors back in America. So there are certain advantages. If you have labor disputes or if you have problems with your China partner, usually if you've negotiated your contract properly, you can um, insist on having the arbitration in Hong Kong with a panel of arbiters picked in Hong Kong, not in Beijing. And I can assure you that will be to your advantage when it comes to settling after the arbitration. Well, I totally agree with, uh, with Andre. Um, Hong Kong does have you know, some of the finest law firms in Asia. Uh, they have been used to dealing with international companies. Uh, we have good financial institutions there. Uh, accountants and so on, you know, who have been used to working uh, with all the international firms. Um, I think, you know, the China market is uh, is growing rapidly. I think, you know, I think that's a that's a given fact. Uh, but a lot of um, operators, distributors, producers, and so on in China, they are really very used to dealing with the West. Uh, they are still very much in the learning stage. Uh, I remember, I think, <laughs> Golden Very Harvest. early learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at Golden Harvest, I think we first went in uh, from a distribution point of view in 1993, 94, yep. uh, with UIP. Uh, we helped them to distribute really the first one or two revenue sharing films. Uh, True Lie was the second one, I think, and The Fugitive from Warners was the first. Uh, and it was a very successful exercise. And uh, basically, we started off the entire uh, revenue sharing scheme. Uh, 
the real pioneer of <laughs> distribution in general. It was, uh, it was very hardworking, but it was uh, a worthwhile exercise. And we learned quite a lot from it. And over the next 20 years, you know, we now see the whole system grow to what it is today. That's not to say that the system in China is comparable to the sophisticated distribution system that you see in Hong Kong and elsewhere around the region. You know, everybody, I gather I didn't go to the morning sessions, I'm sorry, I had to do my day job. But the, the truth of it is, is Hong Kong not only is a great entrepot for China, for the PRC, Hong Kong is a great place to run your entire operation for Southeast Asia because there are markets you shouldn't forget. The Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. And soon Myanmar will come on as a market. You know, that's a lot of people. There's a lot of money to be taken out of those markets. Hong Kong, again, has the people with the expertise, the sophistication, and the history of being able to help Americans learn about that whole region of the world while they're banging their head against trying to learn the China market. I think what we've seen in some cases is, is uh, the establishment by some of the American media companies in Hong Kong as a, as a regional base. And as the, the individual countries mature, they then break them off into, into international offices. Yeah. Um, Fox, Fox did that, certainly, uh, with Star turning Star India into, into a separate operation uh, and, and le leaving a residual smaller office in Hong Kong to carry on nurturing the other businesses. Um, I wonder if you could sort of also elaborate on how, what is Hong Kong's role uh, with China for the outside world? How, how does uh, Hong Kong export other people's films? How that you're involved in that, making films in China and, and exporting them, but you also uh, have many competitors in Hong Kong. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, exporting films from from China from China uh, is something that we have been uh, doing for for many many years. Uh, well, I would say China, but but basically we are talking about Chinese language films. Um, it's very difficult to to distinguish, you know, a Chinese film and a, um, and a Hong Kong a film. Hong Kong film, yeah, yeah, because you know most of the films that we make in Hong Kong now are co-productions, you know, uh, because we d we do need to. Uh, qualify that uh, to explore the China market. Um, to take a Chinese film internationally is not an easy task. Uh, we've been trying that for the last uh, 30 odd years. 40. Uh, 40 years. In Who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, to varying degrees of uh, success, I suppose. You know, in mm. the early years we had Bruce Lee, we had Jackie Chan, you know, mm. and they've done tremendously well. But over the last uh, decade or so, I think the, the challenges are, are getting greater and greater. Um, it's becoming a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but luckily for, for producers in Hong Kong, we now have the home market to fall back on. Uh, we have shifted our attention uh, to the China domestic market. Uh, that I think compensates you know, for uh, some of the difficulties that we have encountered uh, internationally, I think. But I also think this is just my own personal bias of having grown up in the Hong Kong film industry and sort of seen it from both sides of the Pacific before setting up our offices in China. As a filmmaker and as somebody who's been around for a long time, my instinct is that the first real co-productions that will be successful on a global basis will have a significant component that comes from Hong Kong to bridge the cultural differences between what works in the PRC market, or sorry, the China market, versus what works outside of China in the regional market, be it Taiwan, Hong Kong, overseas Chinese, and what really works for the international market. And I can tell you right now, there are very few um, people working in China that are not from Hong Kong that understand those differences. And that's critical to doing real co-productions. I'm not talking about paper co-productions like I'll put some money in and we'll call it a co-production if we shoot three days <laughs> in China or the American idea of let's we'll do a co-production, the American boy falls in love with the Chinese girl and that'll be tremendously interesting to the Chinese market. But real co-productions that are films that 
speak to the audiences of China, the audiences of America, and the audiences of the rest of the world. That requires a, a lot of hard work. And my own gut level instinct is the people that have spent the most time thinking about that and finding ways to bridge those issues are the Hong Kong directors, the Hong Kong actors, the Hong Kong producers, the Hong Kong distributors, and the Hong Kong financiers. Because that's what they had to do for the last 40 years to stay alive, first in the global market and now in the China market. They are the perfect partners, especially for American independent companies that don't have deep pockets and can't afford to spend five or six years learning about China. Hong Kong represents the shortcut for getting up to speed on what to do in China. Right okay. now I'm watching a huge wave of co-production announcements. Everybody's getting in business with everybody in China and somebody said to me at a cocktail party the other night in Hollywood, if you don't have at least three Chinese partners, you're not cool. <laughs> and it's sort of the way Hollywood goes. The Chinese are the flavor du jour this year. But the truth is most of those announcements will not come to a good end. Most of them will be money losing disasters. I, I think that's very well said, uh, Andre. Yeah. That the, 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 the Hong Kong companies and the Hong Kong talent, and by which I mean executives as well as on screen talent, uh, are, the, are, the, are, the, are the pioneers. They've been doing this for a long time. They've paid their dues, they've taken their casualties, they've learned their lessons. And if America, if Hollywood is smart, they will capitalize on that and make Hong Kong their, their partner going into China. But, but can I try and make you to answer one of the questions that came up a number of times this morning uh, in, in different industry sectors, was why not go direct? If you're an American company, why, why would you want to go through Hong Kong as opposed to going direct? And I know that, Albert, you and I had a chat the other day, and you, and you made a distinction, which Andre has also just alluded to, between the difference between independence and the, and the, and the major studios. Yes, I, thi I think the, the major Hollywood studios they have to be sources to do it. I, I think, you know, if you look at uh, for the last uh, four or five years, I think most, uh, if not all, of the Hollywood studios have had presence in China. Uh, but how successful they are, I'm not sure. I don't um, think they're sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think, you know, uh, from the point of view of independent companies, I think Hong Kong would serve as an ideal springboard uh, for them to go into China. If you look around, you know, right now I think Lionsgate is already set up in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, they have office there and yeah. they have uh, uh, quite a few people out there. Um, not only looking, of course, not only looking at the China market, but, you know, the, the, whole, the entire Asia, Asia, Asia yeah. market. Uh, but they have selected Hong Kong as the base. Yeah. And I could see, you know, that trend uh, becoming, uh, happening more often in the future. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but your distinction is between the, the studios which have got the time and the resources to, mm. to, to do it and the independents which have got less resources and therefore can't afford to make mistakes. I think it's more profound than that. Um, as an American who grew up in the Hong Kong film industry and then learned the Hollywood film industry and then went back to learn the China film industry, there are huge, huge gulfs of differences, both in terms of history, culture, um, understanding of how commerce is conducted, how contract law should work, what it means to be in a joint venture, all sorts of things that it's Churchill's line, you may speak, the British and the Americans have a common language that divides them. <laughs> the film industry thinks that it has a common language, but I can assure you that there's a big difference in how uh, PRC partners would look at a co-production and their role in a co-production versus a Hong Kong company uh, joining an American company going into a co-production to go to China. And I think that for Americans that don't know China, it's well worth having a Hong Kong group to explain the rules of the road to you and also to help the China side understand what the priorities are for America. Because trust me, there are very few sophisticated film companies in China, notwithstanding the size of the market, the speed at which it's growing. It's still the wild, wild west. It reminds me a lot of Hong Kong 40 years ago. 
Um, with that brings me neatly on to some of the institutions that are av available in, in Hong Kong, and one of them is, is, is CEPA. Yeah. Um, how, does, how does that, how can foreign companies use CEPA to get into China? Um, well, CEPA is, is the arrangement that was put in place about 10 years ago, I think, when Hong Kong uh, is, is a close the economic, economic partnership, partnership agreement. Arrangement. Arrangement. Okay. Arrangement. Arrangement. You're right. Yes. Uh, which allows Hong Kong companies certain advantages uh, when operating in China. Not only film companies, it, it's a broad base. Um, it benefited a lot of uh, different industries, different businesses, and so on. Uh, film is, is one of it. Uh, I think through the CEPA arrangement, uh, Hong Kong films could be imported into China outside of the quota system. Uh, and also under the CEPA arrangement, Hong Kong companies could go into China to set up distribution companies and, and so on, uh, and to operate in uh, cinemas. Um, I think, you know, uh, a lot of international company could try to, you know, exploit this as a mean of entering into the China market. It's, it's not easy. I would say, but there are specific exclusions yeah. for U.S. U.S. majors trying to use SEPA to sneak in the back door of China, <laughs> but but SEPA is very important because it gave Hong Kong people the opportunity to sort of get into China and start to see behind the wall what how things really do work, mm -hmm. and I can I, I think that for uh, American companies or non-Asian companies, even Japanese companies going to China, there's an awful lot of knowledge that Hong Kong has gained thanks to. I think it was actually SEPA 2 and SEPA 3. So it came in in several stages, yeah. that's right, right. In two stages that would help them to have the correct expectations about what is achievable in China and the best way to go about realizing whatever their goals and their dreams are in yeah. China. Because at the end of the day, the one takeaway is China's a tough market. Under any circumstances, it's a tough market. And the, the rules change every day. And the rules are changing, and the Chinese are competing against each other as well as against competing against the Hong Kong people coming up. And the last thing they need is a bunch of Americans trying to pile in behind them. So you might as well have Hong Kong partners that are already there and have forged strategic alliances and have understandings of how things get accomplished in China. If you want to have a meaningful experience in China, that's my opinion. We're operating under certain time constraints here, so I'm going to ask one more question and then hopefully there are some questions from the audience. Uh, maybe there are bits of paper or maybe we'll have uh, a microphone and people can put up their hand and ask a question. But uh, I, I mentioned institutions. Uh, Albert, you were involved in the setting up of HAF. Um, what, what is HAF and, and why is that significant? Well, HAF is, uh, is, a, is a project market. Uh, it started, I think, in the year 2000. Uh, I ran the 2002 edition of it. Uh, basically, it encouraged you know young filmmakers or local filmmakers uh, to submit the project and uh, use it as a platform to talk to investors from around the world. Um, the addition that I uh, supervised was most unfortunate because it ran into SARS period <laughs> and has to be cancelled <laughs> at the very last minute. Uh, but it was a, a very good experience. Um, Nevertheless, uh, it more or less, you know, it, it um, together with, it right now is a part of the, uh, the film art um, every year. It's uh, making, you know, well, Hong Kong is basically a hub um, for, for this sort of activities in Asia. And it pulls together all sorts of people, um, both from the production side, both from the investment side and so on. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, rewarding. And uh, as, as you said, it's also it's part of uh, Film Art and, and the Entertainment Expo, yeah. which has now become a, a very significant event. I think, I think it is the third largest film, mar uh, film market in the world. I, I, I checked with Jonathan Wolf earlier this morning. He said it's probably the third largest in terms of participation, but mm -hmm. probably number four in terms of business done. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, it, it, it's... Business reported or business done? Uh, business reported. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a significant difference there. Um, th nevertheless, it's, it's certainly the biggest film market in, in Asia um, and sits rather neatly between Berlin and Cannes in the, in the calendar. 
Um, and it also has the, Hong the, the, the Asian Film Awards, which Asian is another, a major marketing asset which Hong Kong has. Mm. How, long th how long have they been going? The, the Asian Film Awards, I think, is now in its sixth or seventh year. Right. I, think, yeah. mm. I hope the lights are going to come a little up a little bit and the microphone is going to start roving over there, please. And then, there's another, then we'll go to the lady there. So uh, ask us a question, please, no statements. Uh, one, two, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Greg, and my question is dealing with the IP protection. We heard earlier this morning at the main discussion that the IP is protected in the Hong Kong court and legal system. But I'm concerned as uh, the Beijing court and legal system back up the Hong Kong legal decisions against pirates. Not sure I quite understood the question, but we're going to try and take it anyway. <laughs> I would share your concerns. <laughs> but I would also suggest that anything to do with IP, again, I wasn't at the morning sessions, IP in China is a work in progress, and it is year by year getting better. That doesn't help those of us that have had our IPs borrowed without remuneration in the past but one can only look forward to the future when that won't happen. I think pro from my personal experience, I think the um, intellectual property, all the laws, uh, they are actually in place in China. I think over the, over the years, I think it's really the implementation of a lot of that uh, is our main concern. But it is coming along, slowly it for is, sure. It is coming along, it's getting a little better. Um, Hong Kong, of course, you know, has a uh, um, a system that we inherited from, you know, the colonial days, um, based on the common law, and um, the IP protection is quite quite well done in Hong Kong. I think but it's, it's done, but it still it doesn't stop the drifting across no. the border. So, uh, you know, IP theft is a problem globally. It's not unique to China. It's just mm -hmm. with the size of the China market, we all find the holes in our pocketbook. Um, there was a very good uh, piece in The Economist last year which described exactly the, the work in progress uh, that, that these two have just described. It, it, things, things are changing, things are getting better. The rules in China now exist, uh, but implementation is, you know, it takes the courts uh, a number of years to get some, uh, some experience as well, and that's happening now. Well, it's also a matter of priorities. Yeah. There was a question here. The lady has the mic. Oh, okay. Okay, um, I, my question goes along similar to what his question is. Uh, you know, what is the organizational uh, procedure for uh, picking up royalties, you know, like BMI, ASCAP, Harry Fox, we have here in the country, if you're a writer, you can get paid there. Um, what is happening over there as far as if you put product out, how can you get paid if you're the creator? There is actually an official body that has been set up in Beijing for copyright enforcement and collection of royalties. They are on an ad hoc basis. As Julian De, the ex-chairman of Shanghai Film Studios, is the current chairman. They are beginning to enforce this, and they specifically started with the music industry. Um, I had occasion to dine with him in Beijing a few months ago and he told me that they will be moving into other areas, but don't expect it overnight. If you're a writer and you think you're gonna retire off of your residuals from China, keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think might is right in this case. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a larger s studio player, you can enforce things rather more easily than as an independent. Um, the, the Hollywood studios are having increasing success and if you have the ability to work with them and have them do the work for you, um, then I would advise that. And then you can sue them to get your share here in Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, you, you, we've, se we've seen this in the software industry, the, the computer software industry, uh, where for years Microsoft and others were, were openly ripped off. And I remember having discussions with Microsoft executives and they said, well, don't worry, as China gets richer and more sophisticated, uh, people will actually, will actually want to pay for the real product. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening. China is now one of Microsoft's largest markets. 
So, so I'm, so I'm, I'm going to stop you because there are lots of other questions. But who's got the microphone now? I think she was before. We are going to get to this lady here. Yeah. She, she <laughs> there we go. Hello, I'm not in the film. I'm not in the film industry. I uh, paint, and I write books, and I want to know how to show my art and get my books published in uh, China and Hong Kong. I'm going to take that question later afterwards because it's not a not a film and TV question. Thank you, thank you for the panel. Uh, Richard Willis, Mozart Entertainment Group. You mentioned co-production, but I'm going to peel back what I felt was your definition a little bit and ask sort of an earlier stage question in terms of co-production. What is the appetite, for lack of a better term, of the Hong Kong? entertainment film investment community for investing in movies that may first run in America but be viable in a second run in Hong Kong and maybe then even in China without it being the token yeah. Asian person in the story. Yeah, Albert, you've invested in <laughs> Oliver, Oliver Stone movies. You're up. Yeah, we did. Uh, we, we <laughs> <laughs> we were one of the investors in uh, Oliver Stone's uh, W. Uh, but, I mean, that's for an entirely different reason. I mean, we, we looked at, you know, all sorts of projects, you know, over the years, um, whether they are co-production or whether or not they are just, you know, simply English uh, international films. Uh, I mean, basically, we evaluate them strictly on the business point of view. Uh, I mean, if it makes sense, if it, you know, we would do it, no. I, I think I'll go a bit more granular on that. My experience, both on the buy side and on the sell side, is that Hong Kong, today at least, will objectively look at any serious business proposition that makes sense. Where Hong Kong does not have a great appetite because there are a limited number of sources of financing, is specking the cost of scripts to be written by people in Hollywood, especially if it relates to subject matters set in Asia, because the feeling is that most Americans really don't have a great feeling for Asia. So if you're going fishing for the money to start the development process, you're probably better off to save the airfare. On the other hand, if you've got a script and you believe that it has a viable business to it, and you can articulate that business plan, you will find that Hong Kong film people are hardcore capitalists and they're very close, they live close to Macau, so they do believe a little bit in gambling. So they kind of look at it as a global market and the proverbial what's in it for us and how much are we going to make above that. The um, reverse of it is if you're in China, I can assure you, as much as there's all this talk about going international, the Chinese investor is only looking at one thing. Can I get my money back in China? And if they can't, they're really not interested in your theories about why it's going to be the highest grossing movie in America. That, that, that's that's absolutely the reality right. of it. That's absolutely okay. right. I, I, I do uh, workshops in Cannes every, every, every morning, and I get asked exactly your question every morning, because everybody's heard about this wall of money that's in China. And they, they, because it's not in, not in America anymore. It's um, oozing out of the streets. But they, and they, but they want to know how to get it. And it, the answer is it's very hard. And the Chinese investors, as these two have just said, need a particular reason to believe your project. And mostly that doesn't work. But there are some interesting occasions where they see a market opportunity that other people haven't seen. The film Cloud Atlas that you saw last year, that had a Singapore investor in a Hong Kong investor. Dr. And Peter and Lam was an investor. And, his and, and, and a China investor. And, and, it, and it worked very well in China. I think the box office figure was 25 million. Country so for country. So the they, could, they could see a reason to do that film that, that perhaps other people couldn't do. Yeah, but that was, if you notice it, the China was investing for China, absolutely. whereas the rest Abs were investing absolutely. on a global basis. And that's really the, the critical thing to understand. It, Hong Kong is an international city. They've been in the business at least 40 years of buying, selling, and trading films. We're going back to when Albert and I were at Golden Harvest, we were the De Laurentiis distributor for King Kong and all those sort of movies. So we bought and sold films for 40 years. 
in buying and selling, we also invested in them. I, mean, I did Cannonball Run here in America. It had nothing to do with China in those days. But that said, that's Hong Kong. It still has to make commercial sense. They're not a bunch of suckers sitting there waiting to fund something that you can't get funded in Hollywood. Well said. Uh, we have time for one more question, I believe. Uh, or maybe two. We've got one on each side. We haven't been this side yet. We got, but let's, well, be, let's have quick questions, Just please. a quick one yeah. in, in terms of HAF. So how do I go about reaching out to that? that well, how would you make the connection? Well, HAF, I think they will start uh, accepting projects for, for consideration uh, hmm. in September. Yeah. I think in September every year. Uh, uh, you will probably find all the information on the Hong Kong International Film Festival website. I think they also have their own they individual, do. They do individual yeah, they do. dedicated website, HAF. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they welcome, actually, you know, in, in the beginning, I think they were s simply focusing on Asian uh, projects. But I think increasingly, I think they are now accepting projects from around the world. Um, this year, I, I've seen uh, some A couple of European French, projects yeah, in there European as well. projects yeah. in that too. So, That's you know, become a global market. Now. Yeah, please, you know, check it out. You know, I think they will start accepting uh, projects for consideration yeah. around September. Last question. Uh, for Andre, uh, the question is, do you see Hollywood accelerating more having um, to shoot Pacific Chinese actors the way that they did for Iron Man 3 just for the appeal to the, the Asian market. Do you see that, that trend accelerating with more major movies? And for Albert, I wanted to know, did you think that when the, a movie like uh, Tarantino's movie came out, um, uh, uh, excuse Django. me, uh, Django, Django. Who, did he need to be based with a Hong Kong company to make sure he wouldn't have had all those editing changes so it wouldn't have been on the docket, they thought it's going to come out and then suddenly it gets yanked? Is that, is, was that a problem because he didn't have a true co-partnership? So just those two questions. You want to go first? No. no. You go oh. first. <laughs> 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 um, uh, to answer the question, as you put to me, I think Hollywood wishes they could get away with the Iron Man solution. Objectively speaking, Iron Man was a failure. It was supposed to be a co-production. Ultimately, it was denied co-production status. It's very significant. It's significant at two levels. One, it's a busted model. Two, the Chinese government was sending a message to Hollywood. As I said, don't think you're just going to shoot a little bit of extra footage, stick it in the movie, and declare this a co-production. China has spoken. Uh, Sarf, the people that oversee and supervise the film industry, have said, no, that's not a real co-production. That's pandering to the China market to try and get through the loophole on the quota of 34 pictures that will be able to share revenues. So I hope that model is gone. People that were involved all made money. The truth of it is there is no reason why you cannot have two versions of a movie providing it's logical that it helps the movie in each of the individual markets and you tell China what you're doing. But to simply say, oh, I'm going to shoot three scenes of the guy in the panda bear because that's great for China and we make it a co-production, it's nonsense. It defeats the purpose of the spirit of co-productions. Okay? The second part of that, though, is if they had really thought about it and they talked to the Hong Kong people that had had the experience, they would have known that it doesn't matter because China isn't America. It's not about parsing words. I did not have sex with that Lewinsky woman. It is about the intent. And so you meet officials in China and they say, you know, it's the other side of it. I don't care whether you think this is a co-production or not. This ain't a co-production. You came and shot three days. Go away. And you can go, but, 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 my lawyer says, your lawyer doesn't matter. It's China. They do things in a very simple, straightforward way. It's not confusing. No, you're trying to beat us at the game. That doesn't work. And a, Hong Kong, and a Hong Kong company. And a Hong Kong guy would have told you that right up front. Say, guys, we can try it, but you're rolling the dice, and the chances of succeeding are somewhere between slim and none. Because you don't get to be a senior government official in China by being dumb, notwithstanding what a lot of American European journalists say. They're a pretty sophisticated group. They get it. 
I don't know if I'm supposed to answer the Django question. I don't mind, but Albert Glass. Yeah, Albert, no. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. No, no the Django question, um, I don't think that it matters. I, well, I would say I'll answer it in a different way. My experience in China is very simple. I've made a lot of movies in China, most of them in the Chinese language. Censorship is, again, not like the rule of court law in America. It's common sense and it's feeling. It's the sense of what's going on in China at the time, what is the intent of the filmmakers, and what is the net effect of the film at the time. So if things are a little nervous and twitchy, the censors will be a bit more uptight. I can't comment on what actually happened with Django because unless you're Quentin Tarantino or you were sitting on the other side of the table, you really won't know who said what to who. As Albert said, it's immaterial. It happens to Chinese films just as much as it happens to American films. They weren't picking on Quentin Tarantino. But the truth is, it doesn't change the fact that it's a big market and we still make movies for that market. We just have to understand the rules of the road. And that's where Hong Kong helps you because they've been at it for a long time. They're smart people. They've tried all the tricks that we're sitting here thinking about. They can tell you which ones worked and which ones don't. That's why it makes sense to work with Hong Kong companies. Andre, we've just been shown the three minute limit. That's actually three minutes more than I thought we had. So we have got time for one more question, if there is one. <laughs> I'll come back I'll to you. I'll come back. I, I promise you before I leave this room, I'll answer your question just for you, okay? <laughs> if not, we'll stop it here and say thank you very much indeed to the two panelists.